Hello, welcome to another Rich Challenge Let's Square Theatre podcast. My guest this time is Dane Baptiste. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, if you enjoy these, why not come and see me on tour? It's going to be mainly in the spring of 2017. My show is called The Best. Go to richtarring.com slash the underscore best slash tour and you can see if I'm coming near to you. Book your tickets now. You never know, they might sell out. Uh, some of them might, you never know. Uh, but now let's sit back. If you come and see that, it helps me do all this stuff for free. That helps because I get paid for doing the tours. Anyway, let's sit back and relax and enjoy Rich Chang's Let's Square Theatre podcast. Thank you. Welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who just yesterday afternoon was administering CPR outside the MI5 building uh, by Vauxhall and the Thames, and that is true. Will you please welcome Richard Herring? Thank you very much. Welcome to the show. Uh, it's Richard Herring's uh, Leicester Square Theatre podcast that you're watching now. But I was, um, I was in a fridge <laughs> the other day and the milk in there is quite cool. And it called it Rehalastabrush. So there you go, that is a little trick. Yeah, I was, uh, yes, yesterday I, I've been filming a uh, short film. I'm a very in-demand actor uh, for productions that don't pay you any money. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I was playing, I can't give too much away, but there was, I was I playing a character who I wasn't really giving CPR. I was pretending to give CPR to someone, and, and, but I was so good it was like I was doing it. Someone came over and thought it was a genuine emergency. That's how, that's how good my acting was. Uh, but we th- it's amazing they managed to kind of get permits to film right outside the MI5 building at, at Vauxhall. You'll know it if you're from London. And, uh, which, and though you could see all the cameras sort of turning to look at us. The police came down and said, what are you doing here? And we showed them the permits. They couldn't believe we'd been allowed to. Uh, but also on the day that we did it, there was a walk between the bridges for diabetes with 2,000 people in pink shirts just walking along the... Tr- so that fucked things up a little bit for us. Uh, in continuity terms, we managed to stop them because most of them had di- diabetes. They were quite easy to <laughs> restrain. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been, uh, we're back a couple of weeks in time for those people at home, but it's been an amazing, it's been such an amazing time for news that news items happened like five days ago that you've now forgotten about because so much more news. Remember like last week when that UKIP bloke did or didn't get punched and nearly died? I'd forgotten that. <laughs> That was only like four or five days ago, because uh, cause, um, uh, Trump has been in the news again. Uh, he's in trouble uh, for uh, gra- grabbing, he thinks it's a good idea to grab pussies. Which is it's never, I don't think there's any, there's no, no occasion when you should grab any kind of pussy, I don't think. The grab is the wrong move, I think, even, <laughs> even with permission. Can I grab your pussy? Well, not grab it. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a, it was an odd thing to do. And in the presidential debate, he said, um, he said, you know, it, it was banter, lo- locker room banter. That's the kind of thing we talk about in the locker room, right, guys? Just <laughs> what pussies we can grab. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. we love it in the locker room to talk about so- sexual assaults. We admire men. That's it. We don't like it in the real world, but when in the locker room, yes, I admire you for sexually assaulting women. That is good. That is not true. I was being sarcastic there, Andy. <laughs> uh, but in the presidential debate, he said, yeah, sure, I've done that. But look at ISIS, look at the things they're doing. I mean, if that's the new moral <laughs> bar, then that's, then we're not, we can get away with anything, can't we? So anyway, it's been fun uh, with, uh, with him. All right, so I should also say um, that, because uh, of the Kickstarter, there's a few things that turn up in these episodes which will be uh, for shamelessly for money. And one of those things is I have to insult Nick Smee, who has paid for me to insult him. And my insult for you, Nick Smee, is your name is a rhyme for Dick Wee. And that is, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that before. Also, Smee is one of the pirates in Peter Pan. So, ah, yeah, take that. <laughs> Not even one of the good ones. Uh, so, uh, taking him down. And uh, also here we have Richard Thompson, who's uh, sitting back there. He should be wearing a hat, but he's a very kind man. He said, I gave him a, uh, a Rehalestaba Day hat, thank you. Uh, it was a happy birthday hat with the birth crossed out and ha- Rahulastapa. 
Red in, in, uh, in uh, Sharpie. That's going to be worth a lot of money one of these days. Uh, and uh, I gave one to his uh, lovely partner as well. And that wasn't part of the... That's a free hat, that was. They cost me two, £1.99 for eight of those, so... <laughs> uh, and they get, they get uh, some champagne. They get the champ whole bottle of champagne. They've got the uh, Antoine de Clavery champagne, which is one of the main... That's one of the main champagnes. That's one of the classy... Have you ever had that, the Anton? Does she, because you look like a sophisticated lady, never had Anton de Clavery. It's 15 quid at Sainsbury's tonight. So that is for a whole bottle. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, he's over there. He, we might get him to ask a question. Thank you very much, Richard, uh, for... I'll, I can call you a fucking idiot if you like, because that's an extra... Would you like that? Yeah. yeah, you're a fucking idiot. So there you go. Thank, thanks for the money. It was nice of you. Uh, he has helped pay for... He's probably paid... In, Half of nearly all of uh, George's wages that's he's paid for you. If you take off the 15 quid for the champagne, though, and two pounds for the hat, I paid for the two pounds for the hats out of my own money. That's just the kind of guy I am. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a man who doesn't go to a pound shop and use a credit card. That is the kind of man I am. So, uh, look, we're going to crack on with our uh, guest tonight. Uh, he is probably best known for his appearance on Celebrity Squares. That's where you've seen him. That's why. All these people have turned out tonight <laughs> to see him. Will you please welcome Dane Baptiste, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Dane Baptiste. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Sit down. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good. I'm, 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 I'm getting over a cold, so you may have to okay. excuse some spluttering between answers. Okay, well that's fair enough. I, had a very, I was very ill uh, last week and the week before, weirdly. Uh, and... Uh, uh, yeah, so it's not as bad as that. I, 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 talk, I said this to Hans Joanne last week, but I had, when I was interviewing Armando Yudich, I had so much snot in my nose that I had to sniff it back and then I couldn't do anything about it, so I just had to swallow. Yeah. You know what that's like? So I've been, yeah, I've been there. Yeah, um, look out for that. I, 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 I won't be as graphic in describing <laughs> those instances. I like to start. So do you remember, what do you remember? The Celebrity Squares thing, obviously. Yeah. That's, that's your main accolade thus far. It is. I mean, I did meet Warwick Davis. So, did you? Yeah, so yeah well, he hosted was, it. That's yeah, cool. yeah, so that was cool. I well, mean, who were the other celebrities on uh, there? I was on with um, Alice Levine of uh, BBC Radio 1 fame, and uh, Frank Skinner was on there. Oh. Uh, Rylan. <laughs> How was he? Talkative. <laughs> yeah. He was cool. Uh, Ashleen B was on with me as well. Oh, she's nice. Yeah, she was nice. And a, I don't think, Catherine Turner I from, I think it's from Coronation Kathleen Street. Kathleen Turner from Romancing the Stone. Oh, no, no, no. no. I would have remembered that. No, no, that would have been amazing. amazing. I love that. I love that film. Looking for celebrity squares there. Yeah. But not her. No, no. So, somebody from Coronation Street. Okay. Um, I was really high up, so it's hard to see the rest of the guests. Yeah. Which, which square were you in? Uh, like the top right. Top right, yeah, it's yeah. not a bad square. Yes. No, it's not, not a bad square, but not good if you get vertigo. No, that's true. If you're playing knots and crosses, go for uh, centre right, yep. then next go top uh, middle. Then if the person paying attention, you can win by going in the top right. Yeah. I Wish I could have offered that yeah, information, that's, uh, but I was, that's, that's I, was answered, I was asked very few questions, so I couldn't really volunteer that information no, really. to the contestants. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, in reality, Dan, you are you're quite a new stand-up comedian. You were, how long have you been going for? Uh, this is my sixth year wow. in the world of stand-up. Yeah, and you were the first black man to be nominated for the first, Edinburgh Fringe Award. First black Briton to be nominated oh, for okay. the Edinburgh Fringe <laughs> Award. Yeah, 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 that's an important thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, so that was in 2014. So that, that so you've done two shows in Edinburgh. Yep, two shows and in Edinburgh. And your current one is um, called Reasonable Doubts, Reasonable. which I am touring at the minute. Cool, cool. And um, yeah, I, I was watching some stuff. There's a lot because there's, there's it's kind of a mixture of stuff. You've got some quite serious subjects you're dealing with, yep, and then so there was a very funny routine about cock goblins, which is yes. less more frivolous, I would say. Yeah, I think I think yeah, I, I try and play the line between uh, yeah. Not getting, yeah, between like getting on the soapbox, but I think it's good to mix the serious with the silly. Yeah. And yeah, and maybe sugarcoat the pill that is the truth in stand up. <laughs> so, yeah. I like what were you doing before you did stand up? Um, I used to work in media sales um, before I had the courage to come out as a creative to my family. <laughs> <laughs> so, after I graduated, I got a job uh, working for <coughs> Rupert Hesseltine's company. Oh, really? Rupert Hesseltine? Yeah, because uh, his dad gave it to him. Okay. So, <laughs> which is always nice if you could inherit a business. Um, I worked for him for, worked for that a few years, then worked for uh, a jobs board, and then worked for Auto Trader. 
Oh, really? In media sales. Okay. All terrible. <laughs> I did. Uh, I did. Media, well, advertising sales at school, but I did it for yeah. uh, for like th four weeks. At the in, I can tell you when it was. I got sacked on uh, Christmas Eve, nineteen eighty nine. Then I said, well, I've only been here for four weeks. He said, oh, well, I'll let you come back then. I came back on New Year's Day to 1990, mm -hmm. and then they sacked me as soon as I arrived, <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't think was really fair. They had a Christmas yeah. thinking. I mean, the fact that you were going into work on New Year's Day was yeah. already unfair. So. <laughs> it, might, it might have been the 2nd of January, but it was certainly the, the first day of uh, work. But, yeah, I didn't sell anything. You must have managed to sell some stuff. Yeah, occasionally, but... Uh as I was told by my manager in Auto, at Auto Trader, most of the sales are down to luck anyway. So <laughs> I don't know why you're getting up your own ass, Dane. <laughs> everyone says they're quite arrogant. But then she'd be like, I need you to put together a uh, sales forecast of clients that you think are 80% likely to buy from us. We're like, well, if it's half sales are down to luck, then I cannot be any more certain than 50%. Yeah. <laughs> then I was given a verbal warning. <laughs> That's a pretty good manager saying, like, yeah, it's yeah. just luck. Yeah, well, no, I'm, she was uh, on The Apprentice as well. Oh, was she? Yeah, yeah. So How did she, was it Katie Hopkins? No, no, she was in the second <laughs> season, uh, Naomi Lay. Okay. And, uh, yeah, well, that's how that turned out. <laughs> <laughs> Right, but so you did, you're doing a sitcom at the moment called Sunny yep. D. Is that partly about that, that time? Or is yeah, it, yeah, so yeah, Sunny D is a kind of uh, semi-autobiographical look at my life before I started doing comedy, uh, which is embellished for comedic effects. So it just covers uh, a lot of my experiences in the uh, open plan office and uh, right. trying to find uh, a, 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 to be a part of, I guess, a cog in the corporate uh, machine that is quaternary industry. And uh, yeah, selling people stuff they don't need, and I guess working for the devil. So, <laughs> but with hilarious consequences. <laughs> so, and so. you're a twin. In you got you, you, in the sitcom. You got a twin yeah, sister. And and you got a twin I, sister. In I real. have a twin sister in real life. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's an hour between us. Right. Which she never lets me forget. <laughs> and, uh, I, I kind of wish that there were two separate days between us, um, but that's not been the case. Uh, it just means that your McDonald's birthday parties aren't as fun as they should be. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, and funny enough, my sister, when we were growing up, my sister had her eyes fixed on a career in the creative industry and entertaining, and she had a subscription to Stage Magazine, and she used to go to auditions. Right. And I guess as an actor, rebellion, I'd be like, oh, psh, I'm going to go work at an office, that's what you're doing. <laughs> and now I do this, and she works in sales. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is there rivalry between twins? Um, or yeah, I, I mean, there is. I mean... Yeah. It's weird. We, it's always, we've always had quite a, um, I guess, a cliched rivalry to the point where when I see other twins getting on, I'm like, ugh, incest, what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> it's weird, yeah. So, Romulus and Remus, of course, they didn't get on. Cain and Abel, they didn't get on. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but she's, I can't hear her, though, because she's a girl. Right, so, yeah. Yeah, I can't really solve problems that way. No. Or murder. Or murder. Because yeah, she's a girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, not, yeah, I mean, that's not related to her gender. No. no. One, <laughs> this, <laughs> murder is murder anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and is, is there any psychic link between the two of you uh, having spent uh, that time in the womb together? No, not no. really. No, no. There's, I don't think there's any real kind of psychic link. Um, I mean, I know when she's trying to fuck with me, I can see it in her <laughs> eyes, but a, no real telepathy. Mm. It's, it's a shame. Although it's very easy for us both to do our data protection if like, a bank calls us. So I know like where she lives yeah. and her date of birth. Yes. So that's enough to if I wanted to steal from her. And you just put on a wig. And yeah, walk, I, and I, walk I could. Put, and yeah, to be. I could. Yeah, yeah, give that a go as well. And, <laughs> you know, and we, like I said, we're in a we're in a we're in, in a society right now where we're becoming more aware that gender is not that rigid and binary. So if I do go into a bank with a moustache yeah. and a wig, then they can't really ask me questions until it's <laughs> after the fact. So. She should be aware of that. <laughs> it's kind of with that the twin thing. So you're like sharing a womb. I mean, you presume you don't remember any of that bit, but no, no, that's. Uh, no. I mean, that's odd, right? You're pressed up against another human being like that. Yeah, know? it's, it's, it's so strange. It's, it must, it's, it's, yeah, it's very weird. It's uh, it, it means I uh, value personal space yeah. a lot more than most people. <laughs> Yeah, and just so one was um, I've watched my daughter born being born. I couldn't stand you know another one coming out after that would have been. Yeah, I mean, and, and the thing is, yeah, and it was it was it was quite yeah it was it was tough. It was yeah. tough. um I was uh, when my mother had my sister and I. She there was a lot of complications during the birth. 
So it was a race against time, which can affect a child. So I have issues with patience and attention as a result of that. Um, also, I was in an incubator when I was born, which was, again, good, because it gave me my own personal space and reflection time. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, it was tough. And, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. <laughs> Not like the, the miracle of childbirth, but yeah. just like the twin thing and the complications. I don't think it's like something that can happen retrospectively, though, is it? You can't like become a twin halfway through your life. <laughs> and it's always like the plot of twins with Danny DeVito. I don't I remember. For sure, you, either, you either are a twin or you oh, are. you're not. But I don't know, stem cell research is uh, you know, improving all the I time. Suppose, so yeah, you could be cloned. Yeah, you could be cloned yeah. as a twin. So you could have like a younger version of yourself. Well, That'd be cool, though. That would be very cool. Yeah. I wish I had a younger version of myself, <laughs> just only because sometimes I meet kids and I think, oh, someone should hit you, but I'm too old to do that. <laughs> 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 With the, the little data, you know, carrying all that stuff out, it'd be great. And uh, you grew up in Hither Green, which I couldn't really... F I like to find out a bit about. Uh, I didn't, don't know anything about Hither Green. It's, it's, a, it's not say remote, but it's almost like it's at the bottom of a valley, and so it's very hard to reach by public transport. But they have a nearby station. Um, but it's interesting growing up in Hither Green because it kind of borders uh, Kent as well as uh, Lewisham, so it's in the uh, London borough of Lewisham. Um, but it's also near Blackheath. Right, yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of connects between a number of different demographics. Okay. Um, it looks quite pretty in the... Oh, yeah. It's, it's got a, a very flirtatious name, kind of hither green. Exactly, yeah, like exactly. So, so, yeah, it's, it's very, very enticing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But and it, and it means that, you know, because it, it's the uh, surrounding areas have been so diverse, I think a lot of people now discuss gentrification. And it's not necessarily a new thing to me because I said I was quite close to somewhere like Blackheath where, yeah. you know, uh, houses start at, you know, one million, whereas like in Lucian, well, a lot of people don't even have houses in Lucian, so it's, it's hard. But um, I think the only thing I, annoying thing I've seen recently in Hither Green was that uh, on my road, uh, some of the parents uh, close off the street to have like, uh, so their kids could play out in the street like yeah. the kids do in America. It was like, there's a park around the corner. There's just no need for this. And it, <laughs> I just found that really annoying. Right. <laughs> Take your kid, just make them walk around to the park. There's no need to close off the entire road. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and your parents are from Grenada? Yes, uh, both my parents. Uh, my dad's from the mainland, Grenada from St. Patrick. My mum is from uh, Karakou, which is a small island. So Grenada is made up of the main island, and then Karakou is a small island, and then Petite Martinique is one of the smallest inhabited places in the world. Karakou has a population of about 7,000, can walk around it in a day. I cannot get into any relationships with women from that island. <laughs> <laughs> for genetic reasons <laughs> um, but it's very nice it's very scenic yeah. um, and it's that right uh, mix of kind of rural but industrialised but not so much so it's, not, it's still relatively unspoiled and you won't see anybody walking around in like football kits at an Irish pub so it's that's nice. <laughs> we went I went to Grenada with my wife on one of our first holidays we went to so I didn't see much of Grenada Oh, yeah. But uh, it yeah, was it's good. <laughs> but it seemed nice. Yeah, no, it, it's yeah. very nice. It, yeah. it felt warm, and I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, it was lovely. Nice. There's temperature help. As we, were there, we, were, we were there at Christmas. It was Christmas and oh, New Year. Cool. We spent there. I, I, I haven't been there for a few years. Uh, yeah. Gary Rose has a house in Grenada. Okay. And I, I intend to buy it one day. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'm going to ask you an emergency question. Mm -hmm. So I've got some new ones. So I'm very excited about that. I've been. I've got to write 500 emergency questions because one of the kickstart things I did was to write a book of 500 emergency questions to give to people. I thought I had probably 250, but I had 100. <laughs> I've, now got, I've now got 140. They're quite hard to write, so yeah. there might be some time before that book arrives. Yeah. It's going to be good when you get it, though, because uh, it'll have questions like this in it. Um, what was the most impressive celebrity you ever came to your school? Oh. Bang! <laughs> so came to my school as like a visitor? Like, a guest, like as a guest, not as a... Oh, as not, guest. I've got, that's another question. Oh, okay. Don't jump ahead to that one. Um, I've got about four questions about guest. celebrities in school. Uh, this is one about, good, like, okay. someone came to give you a talk or oh, came to just whatever as a visitor um, to the school or was a parent of the school. I think it's was it Princess Margaret, I think. Wow. Right? Yeah. Cool. She came, so everyone just had to line up and do some form of curtsy. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> That was pretty much it, and yeah. I'm, I'm not a monarchist, but that was fine. Yeah. I think that's the most famous person I can think of. You know Prince Andrew? I don't, I don't know the him. stories I could tell you about him. So, yeah. uh, so um, I've heard a few of them. I'm, I'm sure that leads to another line of emergency questions. <laughs> it might do. Um, did any future celebrities go to your school? 
that's a good question. Yeah. Um, a few. Uh, Rafe Spall went to my school. Okay. Uh, Sounds uh, like quite a posh school you went to. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, Haberdashers Asks. Nice. So, but it's uh, Hatcham College, which was almost like the outreach one. Okay. So it wasn't like the other, like, so, so people might be familiar with, like, Haberdashers Elstree and Adams, because uh, Sasha Baron Cohen went to that school. Yeah. But I went to one in New Cross, so uh, Casey B, the singer, went there. Uh, Scott Parker, the footballer. Okay. And then Sean Wright Phillips and Bradley Wright Phillips went there as well. So, yeah, that's quite, cool. yeah, impressive alumni. The most uh, famous person who came to my school was Rick Buckler, who used to play the drums in the jam. That's pretty cool. His, uh, his dad was the art teacher, and... Uh, <laughs> sorry, his brother was his art, the art teacher, and uh, when the jam broke up, Rick Buckler came with his new band, Time UK, to play in the school hall, so... How did it go down? Pretty exciting well. day. Uh, well, you know, I would say it's arguable that the Time UK were not as, as good a band as the Jam. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We can have an argument about that. We'll see. Did the siblings of any celebrities teach at your school? <laughs> um. Not that I, not no. that I know of. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Buckler, is Rick Buckler's <laughs> brother to our ass. <laughs> okay, here's another new emergency question. I think, quite, I think those are good. Those, I think that's going to get to some gold dust. That was pretty good gold dust. Mainly the Rick Buckler bit. Uh, can you? <laughs> I just thought, what would I like to ask myself? And thought people will be impressed when they hear about the old Rick Buckler. Remember Rick Buckler? No. <laughs> Could you ever have sex with someone who called breasts boobies? <laughs> Yeah, I could. You could? Yeah. I don't think I could. I could. What if they were doing it during sex? Would you be I, I think I'd have to stop if they said, ooh, ooh, imagine but, I'm a, a lady. Yeah. Ooh, Dane, ooh, touch my boobies. <laughs> could you, would you, I, I'd have to stop at that point. Yeah, I mean, it's all in delivery, I guess. Yeah. So. <laughs> I don't think boobies can, it's weird, because I think boobs is like, if they said, ooh, ooh, Rich does it as if it's me, not you. Yeah. It would be weird, otherwise. <laughs> ooh, Rich, ooh. <laughs> Touch my boobs. I'd go, yeah, okay. But if his boobies, I'd go, sorry, you have to leave now. Yeah. <laughs> weird, I, isn't it? It's, I, weird, I that's weird. That. It's true, it's though, weird. isn't it? I think people you do that, to, like, refer to boobies, it's, it's kind of weird because people are quite repressed and yeah. about their bodies still, so sometimes people say boobies. And I've learned in experience, normally when girls are talking about each other's breasts, they'll say, like, you've got lovely boobs or boobies. Because, yeah. yeah. Because then it just, yeah, it seems less like you're leering, I suppose. <laughs> Whereas men, you, men use more, like, I guess have in their lexicon stuff like tits. Yeah. Which I think is probably more of a turn of fuzz, like saying to somebody, oh yeah, let me see your tits. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's all. It's most of the words for women's anatomy generally are kind of not not as funny as men's ones. Yeah. And not as kind of usable. I mean, it's difficult to think right, of. Yeah. It's that locker room talk we. It is like the locker room talk. <laughs> that pussy is quite an, you know, I, I think it's quite an unpleasant name for. Yeah. It. It. I mean. Some, yeah, some people find it quite aggressive. Yeah. Um, well, especially if you're saying, grab my pussy. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. If you say, gently caress my pussy. That's, yeah. That sounds okay. That sounds yeah. okay. I wouldn't yeah. want to restrict anybody's uh, Lexus, so okay. whatever, whatever helps the mood. <laughs> I think growler's a horrible word. <laughs> if someone uses the word growler, they have no respect for vaginas, so. <laughs> it's quite bad. Oh, this is uh, this is a good uh, new merch question. I made. I made. I was interviewing someone. Some people paid to be interviewed by me. We also, if we put those out, like members of the public. Uh, and I came up with this one during that interview just earlier today. Have you ever lived in an igloo? <laughs> I mean, not you know. No, or no I, I haven't. I haven't. In, as, as far as the structure, but I have. <laughs> lived in a room with igloo of an igloo like temperature yeah. at university, yeah. yeah. So I, I stayed in like a three story house in Bradford. Yeah. And as well as the mice. I mean the house is basically after we moved out, the house became condemned. Right. Um so it's a testament to myself that we could spend the whole year there without any of us getting cholera. And um, <laughs> Yeah, and I remember once just seeing a crackhead run past the window and uh yeah, it was like no garden, so I don't know how you even got there. So, <laughs> but yeah, that's the closest I've come to living in an igloo. I think be, I think living in an igloo would be quite warm. I mean, yeah, unless you unless you maybe touch the sides. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you sleep with your face against yeah. the ice, uh, that uh, might uh, not so, be so good. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm but also, those Eskimos have all those lovely um, 
like big coats, don't they? Were like the, they're like super parkers they wear. Lots of hair, yeah, lots of they layers have lots they of hair have. and pull out tight. I'd like to be an Eskimo. Would you like to live, live with the Eskimos? I, I could try it. Uh, but then, just so I'm aware, because I'm not sure, is Eskimo still a accepted term? Oh, yeah, sorry. Because it's in, sorry, in, 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 Inuit, are, isn't it? If there are any Esko, Eskimos yeah, so in yeah. tonight, I would just like <laughs> to apologise. Oh, because yeah, I was hesitant to use the yes. word because the word, especially Canadians will correct you say it's actually Inuit. Yeah. So. Just one particular, yeah. yeah so now like you've, been, time, yeah, now so you've been racist against the non-Inuit, <laughs> yeah. non-Eskimo Eskimos. I'm, Eskimos. I'm at, I was brought up in a quasar igloo, so it's very hard for me to interact <laughs> with people. And, it's the right term, it's apologies. Shit, I've opened a can of worms there with the old igloo question. I should have, yeah. I should have uh, kept away from that. That was, that was my bad. I'll take that. That was my... Well, it's, well, we'll talk a little bit about, about uh, ethnicity then, shall we, given we got there. Uh, there I, there's a great quote that you, you talked to Brian Logan of The Guardian, mm-hmm. who I don't have that much time for. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if, uh, yeah, This is the quote. If we lived in an egalita- egalita- egalitarian society and people weren't polarised by race and gender, and if there was no glass ceiling for me, I wouldn't need to do comedy for a living. So you think yeah. without, being, without your ethnicity, you wouldn't be a comedian? Well, not to say without my ethnicity, but I was happy uh, being able to do comedy and I suppose perform jokes and performance as a hobby more than a profession. But then I found working within uh, you know, the corporate world that I was encountering a lot of uh, glass ceilings. Yeah. And also, I guess, and that might just down, be down to my act in that a lot of the observations I make are in terms of like uh, dissecting issues like race and, and gender. So yeah. I feel, and I, th- and I think that's, uh, a, uh, I guess I kind of was make, have been, trying to find a more succinct way of saying that a lot of uh, art uh, is and the creation and creativity is kind of stimulated by pain sure. and iniquity and a lot of the time uh, people that are affected by any kind of oppression or marginalization can only articulate that through dramatic performance because yeah. um, for myself personally I feel like so I'm like a hip hop fan for example and I remember Chuck D referring to hip hop as like a uh, Black America's CNN, and I completely agree with that in terms of the fact that um, there's not really a narrative from the African diaspora outside of the arts. So I feel that, yeah, I rely on it a lot, and I feel if maybe there was more uh, equal representation or opportunities for people to assert themselves politically or economically or socially, then you probably wouldn't need art as as much as as an outlet as much as it's useful. So. That's what that meant. Yeah, cool. Did you see uh, the Andrew Lawrence documentary on that was on? Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I have heard about it. Right. And, and I did meet him post uh, outburst. Right. <laughs> so, but he seemed real cordial and. Uh, he's, oh, it's fascinating, actually. I wish you'd seen it. Well, look, you, you will, I'm sure you will see it. But it's it, is before he, we, if you know about this, and it's it's sort of a, weird they made a documentary about it because yeah. it's very much like within the comedy world. He wrote a Facebook post that you know. Yes. I imagine he was a little bit drunk and you know, not really planning if it yeah. to come to. Well, it's like I say to everybody: like a large part of comedy is driving, <laughs> and yeah. if you're driving for maybe three or four hours having arguments only with yourself, you're probably going to win those. And then after a while, even the most outlandish things you think are going to start to sound like they make sense. <laughs> and now, normally, your mind and your mouth, there's a gap between them where you can kind of rationalise that, but social networking exists as a laxative for people's heads now. <laughs> so normally stuff you think and think, oh, I'll sleep on that and maybe I will be a bit more relaxed. Now you can <laughs> yeah. just be like, I think this, this happened to me today. <laughs> and then it's out in 140 characters, yeah. which again, doesn't leave you much time to articulate yourself. No. But yeah, unfortunately for like, uh, people like Andrew, uh, I guess the, uh, the uh, buccal equivalent of a sphincter has been removed by social networking. <laughs> that makes sense. So. It's weird. He's a very yeah. shy comedian. I've met him a yeah. few times. He's, you know, he was doing interesting kind of uh, playing with a fence and playing with a character. Yeah. And even this, I think it's hard to see whether it's... And even he, I don't think, knows whether he's now a character or real. Yeah. Uh, and, and the thing that they, they honed in on the, in the documentary wasn't really the offensive bit about it. I think really, mm-hmm. He was talking about that comedians not 
uh, it's too easy just to take the piss out of UKIP and that's an easy place yeah. to go. Which is true, but also there's, you can still find good jokes about any subject. Well, yeah, exactly. And, then, and it's an important subject to talk about. And they about. keep on giving. Yeah, so. they do. <laughs> and it's an important subject to talk about, so it's just stupid to go, you shouldn't joke. It's, uh, the minute yeah. it was, you shouldn't joke about something stupid. But he said, you know, his bitterness about not being on TV, which I don't, again, quite understand because he's doing quite well, yeah. came out in saying, you know, that on panel shows, you'll have uh, ethnic comedians and women posing as comedians. Yeah. Which are those two... Yeah. That's that's sort of the weird thing. But in the actual in the actual <laughs> documentary, I mean, he's so uh, uh, you know, on stage and in those Facebook things, he's so out there yeah. and and going for it. And then he reads of Steve Bennett reviews, the guy who does Chalk, which is the big comedy website, and he's going, "Well, that's hardly fair," you know. And he's yeah. quite quite mouthy. Then he meets Steve Bennett, who sort of reviews his show to his face, and just he's going, "Yeah, well, fair enough." Yeah, yeah you know, he's this meek little guy. And I think the really telling part of it, which is really <laughs> interesting. Is he's just going? He's going through a scrapbook of all his mm -hmm. clippings from his early days, and going. I just feel sorry for any you know new comedians coming up, and they're told they're going to be the next big thing, and then that doesn't happen. Yeah. And you know, and they, so that's what it's all about. And it's, I it's, think that's exactly what yeah. it came down to. Is yeah. that he, it, it all stems from the fact that you know, I think a lot of people liked Angie Lawrence because around the time when he started uh, breaking through into television, he had a voice which sounded very different to like a lot of his peers at the time. Yeah. Um, and I guess he had it in his head that that was going to carry him and his growth would be continual. Um, but I'm sure he'd be made aware that the, you know, the path of success is not a linear one. And as I said, he kind of ended up voicing his frustrations without somebody to tell him, that's one Janekin. This is why he <laughs> is I think it's interesting because you, like, you know, I've certainly been, you, know, you, you have success and then it got you less yeah. success and it's hard to cope with and you cope with it in different ways and you blame everyone but yourself. Well, yeah. and, you know, but a lot of it's about luck. A lot of, of it's course, about yeah. just being picked up by the right person. And, you know, everyone goes in and out of fashion. Exactly. So you're and never going to be successful all it's, the time. It, everyone has their 15 minutes. Yeah. And it's, it's how you use that. And, you know, he maybe he might think to himself, you know, if he realised, you know, the apex of his fortune then and everything went, went, went well, yeah. then, and then he'd burn out, then what would, he, what would he be doing now? So, yeah, I think he, yeah, that was just a lot of, I guess, uh, angst. That yeah, kind of manifested itself but it's sort of interesting in that way. someone can home it in on that, right? So ethnic comedians, which is not, you know, I, I just when you look at it and say how many uh, people you would classify yeah, yeah. as ethnic comedians actually are on TV, and is it in any way proportionate to the the UK population? Well, I would I would say it is. I mean, and you know, to be honest, he's not the only person that's voiced that. The only difference between no, no. Andrew and a lot of other people was that he just said it out loud. Sure. Um, but I, I would say I've seen more shows about robots than I have about black people on BBC. <laughs> so I've seen more shows about pineapple upside down cake than black people on <laughs> the BBC. So I, I mean, <laughs> I, I kind of found it hard to empathise with his problem there. Yeah. What he refers to ethnic and ethnic is a very ambiguous term it anyway. Is. So well, but it sort of also implies that someone could only they've only got somewhere because of their ethnicity. Yeah. But with comedy. It just it doesn't work like that, does well, it? Well, exactly, yeah, it's because, you know, we can argue that people are put in uh, fortuitous positions because they have, you know, they may tick a few boxes, but you're not going to fool the crowd, so they no. may give you a few, a minute or so grace, but then if you don't have the material, you're not really going to prosper. Yeah. Um, and I would say as well, guys, and in case anybody's wondering, if I could choose to have an advantage in life based on my race, it would not be for 20 minutes on a stage. <laughs> so, if I had a genius, like, what would you, how would you like to play your race card? Would you like to be, you know, six times more likely to be stopped and searched or refused a bank loan or the opportunity to own property? No, I want to be funny for 20 minutes. Oh, <laughs> that would have showed the world. I wouldn't do that, so. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's, my, that's kind of what I think there. And, and then also as well, again, if you kind of break down uh, comedy in the UK by region, I, I would argue probably in most parts of, of the country, your more prolific acts are, you know, white, heterosexual, cisgender men. As far as I know, most yeah. people know who Peter Kay is in the north or John Bishop, and they know Michael McIntyre in the south, yeah. you know, or if you go to Scotland, they'll know Frankie Boyle or Kevin Bridges or Dara Brian or, you know, Ross Noble in, you know, <coughs> I don't know where these poor, starving <laughs> white men that will perform comedy for food are. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, well, again, I mean, that came up with the, the, recently with the Now show as well, and a couple of yep. the presenters, the people who have been with the show for 18 years. I mean, this show should not still be going. <laughs> it's like yeah. 18 years, so you've had a job for 18 years and you lose your job. 
and then you go, oh, this isn't fair. This is political correctness gone mad, which I don't think is quite fair on John Holmes. But uh, yeah. but it's still, you know, it's like there is that kind of element of white privilege of like, oh my god, I've lost my jo- I've lost my job. This yeah, is terrible. Yeah, must be, without yeah. realizing. Well, exactly. Yeah, and you know. It's, I don't. I don't think there's any need to get that petulant because then you could argue then why are all these white guys losing jobs because you know a few of you were fucking people's children. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. <laughs> Most of the cast of the Now Show that is that is that so <laughs> deaf. It'll be twenty years before we get to them, but they they are deaf. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I, I don't know, with, with all, I mean, the, the, we got in this really weird situation where, like, things are kind of colliding, aren't they? And the, the political correctness and things are moving yeah. in the right direction, and then there's sort of the death rows of yeah. extreme religion and, and also of extreme right wing people in, in yeah. you know, what's happening in America is sort of insane. Yeah, in the you know it's, it's it's again that white privilege or people yeah. who feel they're being challenged by something they're not really yeah. being challenged. And by. Same thing, you say it's a death throes, and this is the thing. The thing about uh, white privilege is that it kind of it can, as it exists, it works against you know people that aren't in the uh, within that uh, what's called the I guess collection for protection of white privilege. But then at the same time, it works against you because it it supposes that being white predisposes you to a better life, which makes it a lot more difficult that if obviously your life, no one's life is perfect, it makes it a lot harder for you to receive any kind of empathy. And, it's, and really, even discussing white privilege where you're looking at it as a positive or negative thing as a white person, it really is just used as a tool to further divide people anyway. Um, and it, it's like a Bill Burr said that a lot of time is that you know, people think, oh, if I was white, everything would be easy. And I've never been under that impression in the first place. You know? And it's the fact that uh, rather than looking at stuff like white privilege, I think that a lot of the comics that are referring to it are uh, conforming to, uh, I guess, business standards as opposed to, you know, being true to the art of it. So people are like, I don't know if I can do this because of political correctness. Well, yes, you can because you have a microphone and you have your own mouth and you have free will. So you say it and deal with the consequences. And that kind of, I find that kind of annoying sometimes. Like, I don't know if I can say this. Or I'm not allowed to say this. Well, you are allowed to say that. So if you're afraid of the consequences, then you're a coward and that's your business. But you can't blame anyone else but yourself because you're in control of yourself. You write your own material and yeah. you should be able to deal with the consequences. Have some balls about it. <laughs> <laughs> or gonads about it. Again, not gender specific. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's true. And, I think, well, and also these people are basically saying, oh, I'm saying the stuff that we're not, you're not allowed to say. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely, you know, I mean, fucking Donald Trump's saying all the stuff. Yeah, and, I mean, yeah, exactly. And, and doing all this stuff and not getting... Donald Trump's been saying it for years, yeah, yeah. as is uh, Bill O'Reilly's been saying it for years, Rush Limbaugh's been saying it for years. Yeah. So really, some of the stuff you're saying is kind of hack when you think about yeah. it. There's been a right-wing narrative for a long time. And also, really, if you are, again, before anything else, I think, and this, I guess my, my own personal opinion is that as a comic, you really shouldn't even be seeking to conform to the bipartisan paradigm in the first place because what you're doing is trying to get to scratch the surface and get to people's consciousness. This is what we're doing. It's a stream of consciousness. So you shouldn't even be thinking about it in terms of uh, right wing or uh, left wing structure. It's just like, this is how I feel. And before anything else and before anyone has any political allegiance, they're human beings. And people, most people cannot be rigidly, can't be rigidly right wing. Um, I got into an argument recently with somebody online after doing news quiz, and he was accusing us of being uh, leftards and socialists, and this went back and forth because comedians, yeah, comedians, comedians. yeah, comedians, and this went back and <laughs> forth uh, because I like to practice something called troll judo, where <laughs> you know, just deal with them with some effective takedowns, and he uh, said, and I, he was saying something about exercising my brain, and I made a reference to saying his stru- his uh, his physique saying, I don't think you're somebody who should be pontificating about exercise. <laughs> and then he said, well, it's because I'm disabled. <coughs> right. Which I guess was him saying, well, now you should feel bad. And I was like, well, that's strange because the fact that you're referencing that you're disabled is that there should be some empathy from me, which can, sounds kind of socialist when you think about <laughs> it. So, yeah. And, and then also, but it's, but it's even, it's even when you know, people are being outspoken about you know, socialism and you, you do realize that there was like a billion pound bailout for banks, which are the epitome of uh, a free market. So then too big to fail doesn't really make sense in terms of a capitalist structure. So I think anyone who considers themselves smart enough to say these things should be aware of that as well. Otherwise, really what you're doing is just you're just regurgitating 
stuff that you've read, and then, yeah, that's just, just an idiot, really. <laughs> but more sitting way of putting. Like it. getting, embroiled. I mean, I, I always do. I get embroiled in all the twist stuff all the time yeah. because I kind of, it passes the time, doesn't it? It and does pass the time. Enjoyable. But I know, you know, and I like, I like. What I find interesting at the moment is there's certain things if you mention them, and it's not just it's it's on all sides because yeah, yeah. like Jeremy Corbyn's one of them. Yep. If you mention Jeremy Corbyn, suddenly oh, ten yeah. people who don't follow you will have something to say about that. Yeah. So they've clearly got <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn box. In, yeah. their, in their Twitter. Yeah. It's not that someone's retweeted it, it comes in too fast. Alerts, They're just yeah. ready to come in and they come in with some They're extreme alert. comment and quite rude comment. Yeah, all the time. Uh, and today it was about Brexit. I mentioned Brexit and I yeah. even said in Brexit, I'm mentioning Brexit and therefore I'm about to get five comments from people yeah. I don't know who will be very rude to me. And sure enough, some people came in and it's and they've then kindly proved me right about that. Yeah. But it's, you know, the, the people... Are, and then and what I love about the Brexit, the remains versus the leaves is... Uh, you know, they, they think you're obsessed with it. You're obsessed with it and going, you are, you've got a box on your Twitter yeah, waiting exactly. for someone to say Brexit. I don't even so know you. I don't even come know in you. and call them a fucking yeah. twit. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, yeah. I don't, you I don't, don't even know you. Me. You don't know anything about me. Exactly, so it's, yeah. It's, so, it's but I think, does it, does it create just a crazy little... I, I, I wonder whether, A, the social media thing has, has allowed those kind of views that were... was being sort of pushed away and maybe yeah. not stamped out, but just were forbidden and people, mm -hmm. were, people felt they couldn't say them and it gives them that... They're coming out of the shadows a bit because they're able to say stuff. And then has that, in turn, has that led to Donald Trump and all these people? Because suddenly they've, they've gained yeah. like, confidence I, as a result of it. I, I, think they, I think those are two separate uh, phenomena in that all social networking has done is that it's given people the idea that opinion is validated because it, you have something tangible or something visual that you can see. And... Whenever people uh, come to lament the whole thing about vicious trolls and the things they say, I always tell people to remember, and I always, I'm always able to rationalise it, especially if you're working in comedy, anyone who's trolling you and hiding behind some kind of avatar, and, as I, and, I've, and I've always reminded trolls of this fact, is that whatever you say, you go to work and be a different person, and you shut up and you get your boss's coffee. <laughs> I say what I say on stage too. Yeah. Like a man. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that. Yeah. <laughs> or, but then at the same time, I always tell people, you know, before Twitter, any kind of you know vitriol that you saw from trolls is the only thing you only see that in like a service station toilet or on a school desk or at the back of a bus. Like when you used to be at school, you might see someone with school a SWAT sticker on a desk, and you think, well, that's not nice. But then you you as soon as you leave the desk, you don't think about it again. And it's only because of social networking and because it remains there that it seems very serious. Yeah. And you know, I've met people in real life and who are trolls, and it's a real sad existence, guys. So, so we don't really worry about it. Yeah. But, um, Whereas the whole thing with Donald Trump, I don't, I don't think necessarily that he is given uh, validation and allowed his people to kind of resurface again. Um, I think they were kind of always there. And as you said, I think it's just, uh, I think these people kind of realize because of social networking that there's now an opportunity for different narratives from around the world and from historically marginalized groups to have a voice. I think some of these people are realizing that despite what they've been fed, they are actually in the minority. Yeah. And, actually, and that scares them. And so this is just them trying to attempt a backlash at the fear that people of their political uh, disposition are basically on the way out. Yeah. And so, but then at the same time, I think the whole Donald Trump thing, I kind of, I, I, I like it because I guess I'm a bit of a nihilist. And, <laughs> and also I've kind of, I personally feel I've just observed, I've observed at the turn of the century uh, just Western civilization having more of a focus, and we've kind of gone from capitalists or people thriving within a free or mixed market to consumerists, where we no longer have a system of supply and demand. It's more supplying a demand and just stimulating demand, and people want things they, they don't really need, but it's mm -hmm. just said that they should have it. And he's just a personification of that, you know? He's a ruthless capitalist, he, he engaged in double standards and duplicity, and, you know, he's a misogynist, and it's, I think it's, there's a reason why he's here, is that we need to look at this monster in the face because we've kind of created that. Because yeah. you know, we, in a, a lot of time, people do turn a blind eye to uh, things like rape culture, and we do turn a, a blind eye to rampant capitalism at the expense at, of you know, our ecosystem. Sure. Yeah. And you know, I think about stuff like, I don't have any kids now, but you know, people always say, you know, when your kids get old enough, you have to tell them about the birds and the bees. You know, the way we're going, that might be a short conversation. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's. I think yeah. In answer to the question, like they're two separate things. But I, I just, I just think that sometimes uh, society forgets that technological advances do not go uh, 
at the same speed as human evolution. So we're still very similar people, uh, or the same kind of people that we were, you know, maybe a hundred or so years ago. So well, probably even longer. I mean, thousands. Yeah, 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 thousands of years ago. So sometimes I think, who were the kind of people that would go out and watch a public execution? Those are the people that are on Twitter. Yeah. So weirdos. Yeah. I mean, the political system feels like I'm um, definitely the UK's political system feels broken. You know, oh, the, the party yeah. system well, is definitely. as broken. Yeah. But like, there's now no choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But even when there was two choices, that still wasn't enough. But now there's five or six, seven, eight, nine, ten choices. That system doesn't work anymore. And I, and I think all of these votes, the Donald Trump thing, because he's not really losing. No, he's, he's not, losing he's not a bit of votes, but not. Well, like, not as much as you think. For not some of the things he said. All the things. Yeah, but all, all of the like things he said. Now he's suddenly, yeah. you know, everything he said before has been equally as bad. Yeah. But again, it's because of the fact that you know, in society, there's a lot of maxims that we have that we repeat to ourselves, and we don't really think about them. Like whenever you think about politics, and again within this bipartisan paradigm, people always like, well, you have to pick the lesser of two evils. There shouldn't be any evil. <laughs> shouldn't be any evil. Shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be, there should not be a, a, a choice between two evils. Maybe there shouldn't be any evil when it comes to a political process. Like, no one considers that. So, yeah, I think, I think maybe we're at a point now where we need to revamp our entire system. And it's just weird for people to understand or and kind of deal with that because most people that are alive now have no precedent mm. or, you know, so something needs to change and just we need to create something new and, and we're all responsible for that. And leaving the EU was that thing. Well, so well, yeah. Now we've done it, everything will be fine. Well, this is, yeah, we'll see <laughs> so how that How goes. much is the pound worth against the euro now? Oh, okay, no, it's probably fine. Uh, <laughs> that's probably fine. No, that was very interesting. Very deep stuff, which I knew this was going to be. Yeah. I, I no, it's okay, but I like, I like it. I, it's... I mean, your stand-up is deep as well. Yeah, but I'm going but to say because I feel like I'm losing some people here. No, so no, we're going to throw something stupid in again. <laughs> <and then laughs> we can just. Bring how it about back how about I ask you an emergency <laughs> question? But if, you know, these people like listening to stuff. They're idiots. Oh, so okay. so they're not they're not like a normal comedy audience who <laughs> need a joke about willies. Uh, yeah, there you go. So we're off. Yeah, they're off. Uh, hooray. They're off. Hooray. Well, it works for That's me too. Nice. Uh, funny. <laughs> um, if you were given the powers of a King Midas but could choose the thing that your fingers turned everything into, what would you choose to turn everything into that you touch? Oh, to turn everything into? You know, he turned everything into gold, as you are aware. Uh, but, yes, uh, he did. Uh, so, but, uh, but you can anything. choose anything, but everything you touch is going to turn into that into thing. Into that thing. Uh, it's a, watch out, it's a poison. It sounds good, yeah, but, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not good. A, a potentially not a poison as good chalice. as you think. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, if you chose everything to turn into a poison chalice, it's really a poison chalice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, That's a really well, bad choice. This is a tough one. No, you can get some money for the chalices. <laughs> but then they're poisoned in the purple. Oh, Probably yeah. people would drink it in their arm. And then they'd be dead. Yeah, they'd be dead, money. yeah. But then um, I guess but then any law enforcement would also be poisoned chalices, so yeah, I'd get off scot free. <laughs> so it's, it's one to consider. You'll get to the point where people stop drinking from the poison chalices. I think they would realise all the chalices were But then poisoned. all the newspapers to warn them would also be poisoned chalices, so That's there's true. Really, <laughs> But what, what would I choose to turn everything into? Uh, hmm. I, 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 would, I would like to think maybe some kind of nondescript energy. <laughs> so, the, and then, yeah, and then I guess, can I say, okay, just turn people into just like pure consciousness. Right. And then, so that way if people aren't, you know, conscious of their mortal coil yeah. and, that, and how they perceive it then, I guess everyone would be part of that collective consciousness again and wouldn't care. Yeah, wow, that's so. a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's a better answer than that question is there, isn't it? You were thinking I'd do the skittles like the bloke on the skittles. <laughs> you create know, all those skittles. Yeah. But every time you picked up a skittle to eat, it would turn into a load of skittles, mate. You haven't thought it through. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> you like skittles. Because um, I used to like skittles, but then they were 20p at the shop and I bought too much and got a really bad headache once. And that's why I didn't go for Skittles. Really? Okay. Yeah. So, in case anyone was wondering. I've never eaten that many Skittles and I've eaten a lot of Skittles. Oh, like uh, in America, they have like five different types of Skittle yeah. in the packet. So yeah. it's very easy to get very sick on those. <laughs> it's a cautionary tale, guys. Do you know uh, CJ from Eggheads? No. No. <laughs> have you ever killed someone but never spoken about it? <laughs> no. no. Okay. No. It's a good question and most people have said no so no. far. 
but one person's going to trip up on the ending when that, <laughs> when that day happens. Front page news for little Richie Herring. <laughs> ka <-ching. laughs> It's what? Chris Addison. Oh, I, I, he smashed some cupboards without telling anyone. That's what he's done, Chris Addison. We'll find out about that. I'm convinced it's him. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's have a look. Um, there was one I was going. There was one I looked at earlier that I wanted to do for you, and then uh, yeah, I forgot what it was. Um, Richard Dawkins claims to have seen dogs doing a sixty-nine. <laughs> What's the worst lie you've ever told to impress? <laughs> <coughs> Always works. I I, uh, I told a girl a few <laughs> years ago that in fact moths go towards the light because they're looking for the darkest part of the room, which is behind the light. <laughs> <laughs> Makes no sense. <laughs> Makes no sense. Was she um, impressed by that fact? Initially. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I forgot that Wikipedia existed, so <laughs> I, I, I brought it back, though, okay. with shots. <laughs> <laughs> that ended a lot happier than that sounded, because I just <laughs> want to give you that caveat that we had fun. Uh, is there a, a celebrity that you're mistaken for? Uh, not mistaken for, but other comics I get mistaken for. Like oh, yeah. Two comics in particular, one called Marlon Davis okay. and another one called Nico Yearwood. Okay. Uh, and Nico told me that when I was nominated, people were buying him drinks. Right. <laughs> uh, which is fine. Live, yeah. it, live it up. But, yeah. but don't do anything too bad. Like, <laughs> like take advice, don't Cosby out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I work, people are always tweeting me, telling me I'm like, you know, what, are you, what are you doing in McDonald's in Peterborough or whatever? <laughs> uh, and so there's loads of blokes who look like, enough blokes who look like me that people genuinely think it's me. And I wanted, one time I wrote a Metro article about someone swearing and, and in public and me being annoyed about it. And someone said, well, that is ironic given how you were behaving in that curry house in Walthamstow <laughs> last night. And there was some horrible Richard Herring lookalike. <laughs> Claiming to be Richard Herring, going around, I presume, being racist and unpleasant yeah, yeah, and, in yeah, the current And being house. boorish. And this is what I'm saying. Uh, having a twin sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can cause problems. Good. Uh, if you had to choose between dating a man who was a six-foot-tall penis or a man who, instead of having a penis, had a tiny man where his penis should be, <laughs> which of those two men would you go on a date with? One of them's a penis. <laughs> Really when penis. I said man, I mean he, he's I, a you know he would identify a, as a penis. Is he like a? Does he still have like? Is he still able to talk and stuff? Yeah, and he's got. He's got. Uh, like what I've given like an articulated, him, an articulated penis. What I'm giving him is a face. Yeah. On the helmet. Uh -huh. And uh, the the you, the uh, meatus, the opening is not yeah. his. That's just at the top of his head, like a blowhole. Uh -huh. His eyes are on his helmet, and mouth has got no. But apart from that, he's just a penis, no balls. Mm -hmm. He'd sliver around like a sort of slug. Yeah, yeah. So he he might wear a suit. With like false arms on it, like Rod Hull, yeah, yeah. just to make him look more, to make yeah. him feel more comfortable in human society. And so, and that if he is either entertained or aroused, is he, is he able to stand up? I, I think he's pr permanently erect. I think. Okay. Cause I think yeah. otherwise it would become yeah. humiliating for him. Okay, yeah. I'm going to go with the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone does. Okay, yeah. Everyone does. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, I, th I, th I thought I had some. Uh, uh, let me see if I've got another good new one. I've been writing so many emergency questions that I've kind of lost my track with uh, with what. Uh... Oh yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> this is a bit like the King Midas one. If you could choose the liquid that you weed, what liquid would you weed? Uh, it could be any liquid, but it's a bit like the King Midas one. Be careful, because you know you just have to get rid of the. The poisons in your body somehow. Oh, okay, so so you know you think I'll oh, be great. I could just wee beer and then I drink beer, yeah. but you know you would die. So yeah, it would be a vicious cycle. You would, of yeah. drinking and. Yeah. But if there was a liquid you could have, okay. instead of this one, have this is a better one. <laughs> <laughs> if you were God, this is it. This is what I want to ask. If you were God, what flavour would you make have made ejaculant? <laughs> Because it's like God didn't even consider yeah, yeah. It, that it was going to be eaten. It's like that was yeah. a surprise to him. <laughs> it? Because he would have made it taste of something different, I think, than it does. Uh, poor it's foresight it's from God. It, yeah. What would you like it to taste of? Um, well, I guess it's me being considerate of potential lovers. Yeah. So, uh, Double spunk. Of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More concentrated. <laughs> Salt. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's um, um, I mean, some people like the taste, right? Yeah, some people do. Well, yeah. 
Could I don't know why I'm looking at you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I just... <laughs> I just imagine some people yeah. do. I would... Something... I don't know. Uh, like coconut water or something, I guess. Because yeah, I think they still have this, a similar consistency. Yeah. And, yeah. Is coconut water change. the same as your spunk? Because that is... Yeah. There's something wrong. I think it depends how... I mean, you're a younger man than me, but that, that, yeah. is, that is wrong, isn't it, right? It's got to be a little bit more... I, I, do, I do very little research post... Okay. <laughs> post-coitus. If, so. if you'd known... If you'd listened to the show before, you would have realised it's mainly about... You know, weird. I let you talk for about 20 minutes about something serious, yeah, then and then it's mainly ejaculant and weed. It's, 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 good, it's, good, it's good to know. Um, How about this one? How do you sleep at night? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, 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 I toss and turn a lot in my sleep, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, sometimes, so, yeah, it's, it's the start off my back. I normally sleep facing the door. Okay. In case people come in. Right. So... So yeah. you can say hello. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> take her. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, so I, it varies, but it's normally facing the to the door. Yeah. Yeah. In case there's a fire, so I can help people, and also because <laughs> I feel like I have the physique of an arsonist. <laughs> so I like to be able to get out and get my alibi sorted first, because <laughs> I feel <laughs> once the uh, the you know fire brigade arrive, they're gonna take a look at me and be like, well, here you go. <laughs> that was another. That's another scandal. It's just, it's just a thing I have. Is why I also I don't sleep in the nude because I'm just gonna look like a naked arsonist, <laughs> <laughs> and that's an easy way to shift tabloid newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> naked arsonist. <laughs> <laughs> Who would you prefer died, Windsor Davis or Matthew Crosby's wife? <laughs> <laughs> Do you, know, do you know Windsor Davis? Not that well. No. So I guess it's him. Yeah, OK. He's always an old man. Do you know Matthew Crosby? I do know yeah, Matthew yeah. Crosby. And do you know his wife? I do know his wife. Yeah, she's and nice, isn't she? She's really nice. Yeah. And Matthew is such a sweet guy. Like, just yeah. picturing the grief on his face yeah. would just be on my conscience too much. So, yeah. sorry, Windsor. It's all right. I feel like his family could handle it a lot more. Well, Windsor Matthew. Davis is probably the, not. Yeah, he's the sort of. He was in the sitcoms in the seventies, like yeah. uh, Dan, Don Warrington, who you've got in yes, your yeah, yeah, yeah. in your sitcom. Yes. Was that? Did you have you, seen, have you seen Don's previous work when you can't? He's your played your dad. Yeah, I had I seen some of his stuff on Rising Dam. Yeah. Um, I unfortunately didn't get to see him playing King Lear. Um, but yeah, he is. Uh, I I'd never used the phrase choose the scenery, but he does. It's really weird. We, were, <laughs> we had a, we had a table read during filming. And every, I get, kept getting pulled aside. Everyone was like, look, Dane, please, please, the execs are in. Please, can you project? I know you like to mumble. Please. So I had this thing where I had to put a cork in my mouth. I don't know if anyone here has experience with theatre. So they gave me a cork in order to help me with my enunciation and to speak louder and project. Whereas Don, was, he wouldn't even look up. It would just be like booming throughout. Like THX, he just booming throughout the whole room. Right. It was amazing. So yeah. yeah, I was very much in awe of him. Um, I'd have to kill him too, do I? No, you can, you can, no let, let's let him live forever. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah. He's great. So you're doing a series of Sunny D? Yeah, so the series is out uh, 30th of November. will be available oh, on the BBC iPlayer. Um, and so, oh, so it's going straight onto the iPlayer? Yes, yeah. initially. And they will be hopefully around on terrestrial television. Um, but I like to work to, work to worst case scenario. So in the meantime, <laughs> yeah, let's uh, check it out on the iPlayer. And yeah, I, and at the same at the same time, I kind of like that it's on iPlayer as well. And you know, yeah. we are people do consume digital media now a lot more, and yeah, we're kind of a Netflix generation whereby, you know, people will uh, look in more detail at shows. And so there are quite a few uh, Easter eggs as they're referred to in the uh, in right. the show. So yeah. Do they all go up at once on is going to be the whole series going? Um, up I once? think it will be go weekly initially okay. for the first run, um, but then, but I I don't want to speculate and let anybody down, <laughs> so I was just be conservative and say it'll be weekly, and on either iPlayer. Cool. I think you guys will like. <laughs> and you continue. Is the tour still going on? Tour still going on. Yeah. So the tour goes on uh, into early December um, and uh, includes a run at the Soho Theatre uh, the first week of November. Um, but if you're not local to there, I will be going uh, as far up north as uh, Bradford and then and, and down in uh, Newbury and Berkshire. So I'll be all over. And it's been fun. Um, so is, it, is it a theme show or is it...? Is yeah, it's, it's, reason, but it's a theme show. So it's kind of... Uh, the, the title came from the fact that it was my uh, second show. So it's my 
so I was worried about the sophomore jinx, yeah. which is where uh, Reasonable Doubt's coming from. And yeah, so this, the arc of the show is about, first of all, me dealing with some of my uh, more personal doubts about the fact that the more you give to something like comedy, the harder it is for you to do stuff like maintain a relationship and keep in touch with friends. And yeah, like that isolation will give you, I guess, what's Andrew Lawrence syndrome now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then me talking about more social doubts, so he's talking about stuff like race and uh, gender and if we can all get along. And, uh, and then finally, more global doubts and some more rational and more irrational doubts, like are we on the brink of a zombie apocalypse yeah. or a nuclear firestorm? And talking about stuff like, I guess, uh, trident and nuclear proliferation, which I think is a really weird thing because if you are for nuclear proliferation, do you want to be right though? <laughs> it's like, I ah, see, I told everybody, now eat your cockroach stuff, rats, kids. <laughs> No, I don't want to eat. That's disgusting. I'd hit you if my hand hadn't fallen off from radiation poisoning. Like, no one... <laughs> why, nobody ever wants to be happy. It's a weird thing with missiles because the investment is something you'll never get back. Yeah. So it's stuff like that. No, normal stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and when you tour, do you tour on your own? Do you take, go out with another act? I, I, go, I go out with another act. Yeah. Um, and it's always good, yeah, as I said, to have company. So I'm not yeah. spending too much time winning arguments in my own head. Um, <laughs> and they've all, been, they've all been great. They've all been very strong and, and uh, very varied. And... Yes, there is some white, male, heterosexual, cisgender men doing tour support as well. Because <laughs> they're good at what they do, not because they're white guys. <laughs> and you were support for... My wife saw you with Catherine Ryan. At yes. The, uh, it was, how was that, doing the O2? Uh, it concert? was amazing. Uh, it's always good. Uh, it's great uh, car journey. Um, Catherine and I have a fondness for conspiracy theorists, con right. conspiracy theory, especially involving the uh, world of entertainment. So it's always good for discussion and a lot of our, our theories. For example, yeah, I, believe, me... I believe that Michael Jackson, uh, his cells have been taken and something I've called Project Moonwalker <laughs> <laughs> involves uh, the music industry attempting to clone him or treat other stars with his genes. Right. <laughs> and what like, evidence do you have for this? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's, I got, there's loads of evidence, but... Might not be a safe space to discuss it right now. But, like, you know. It's, there's no one here, okay. really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think because some, like, there's, there's some, uh, there's some uh, I guess, stars now who have the appearance of Michael Jackson or sound like Michael Jackson, like The Weeknd. Okay. He sounds like Michael Jackson, whereas Neo writes like Michael Jackson, whereas Chris Brown is uh, has very temperamental. Uh, I don't believe Justin Bieber is one of Michael Jackson's clones. And I feel like he, they are trying to put him in the position of being Michael Jackson, but that's never going to happen, guys. And I'll tell you why. It's because you cannot abuse a white male in the same way that Joe Jackson did to Michael <laughs> without being arrested. <laughs> I said it. <laughs> wow. OK. Uh... <laughs> what about Paul McCartney being not Paul McCartney? What do you think about that one? That's my favourite conspiracy theory. I mean, you know, if he wanted to have a clone, he's got the finances to do it. Yeah, but so. he's dead. The real, the original one's dead. It's the post. Uh -huh. I mean, to be honest, the clone has done so much more than the original Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah. He deserves everything he's got. Yeah. So, but yeah. He's, he's, he's piggybacked onto the original just by dint of looking exactly like him, luckily, and... Yeah. being able to play the bass. And, then, I mean, look, and that's not new. Like, lookalikes have always been for people, the rich and powerful have always had lookalikes. Saddam Hussein used to have lookalikes in order to avoid the risk of assassination. But that's a really hard job to go for. Because if you're too good, then, you know, you might be assassinated. <laughs> if you're not good and you go to the audition, just on the basis of insult, you'll be assassinated. So you can't really win. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. I may, have, I may have stamped on some people's dreams there, but yeah, so. they, well, there's <laughs> a, I should have said there's a lot of Saddam Hussein fans in here who are still <laughs> pretty upset about what happened. But maybe yeah. <laughs> the light at the end of the tunnel there is it might not have been Saddam Hussein who got hanged yeah. in that room and videoed while he did it. That was awful. Um, you know, I'm not saying I'm not saying he didn't deserve it, but I, no, I don't think he did deserve it. Well, because I don't think anyone deserves to be uh, killed. I don't believe in uh, capital punishment. Well, I mean, I mean, that's the, this is the thing about capital punishment that I find most scary is that, again, if you look at the, uh, the prefix of it being capital, there are now businesses out there who have built, uh, <laughs> they built a business model uh, on the basis of supplying the instruments of death, 
which means that there are people that have meetings like, oh man, guys, not so many people have committed capital crimes this year, so no Christmas bonus. Like that's <laughs> really weird that some yeah. people are like we need to you know increase our profit margins and or influence law accordingly so that people can be you know convicted of a crime and then sentenced to death because people make money from that. People provide those instruments of death, and then and then the question is, if you are able to uh, you know endorse a complete stranger dying for what you imagine might be a slight, then how are you that different from a murderer? So, and clearly, you know, it's not a deterrent because murder has not gone down in <laughs> states where they have capital punishment. So, Do you think yeah. if we had a referendum in the UK about whether capital punishment should return, it would be yes or no? I think it's scary, but I think it'd probably be a lot more divided than people think it might be. But then at the same time, people again say a lot of stupid things. Like I hate when people say stuff like, we should bring back national service. And if people went to war, these kids would have, you didn't go to war. So <laughs> why would you suggest that for other people? And then at the same time, why, it's like for me, like this, these ideas about stuff like going back to the old days, it's like, oh, maybe kids should be forced in the army, we should bring back conscription. But then at the same time, if the idea is about help for heroes, we're in the midst of watching an NHS be privatised. So when these guys are coming back from war, who have been the heroes that you've asked them to be, they won't have access to like any kind of physiotherapy if they are, you know, victims of an IED attack or if they're suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, or just a system of being re rehabilitated in society that's not going to be provided for them. So, do we really care about these heroes? And I'm saying that because you know, some people may argue these are the kind of things which are uh, described as white problems, but these acts who say uh, you know they they're held back by political correctness, they never say stuff like that. I, and I find it weird, you know, Andrew Lawrence, uh, for example, you know, making references about you know how women have a women are having like you know preferred treatment in the world of entertainment. Again, you think most women are thinking, oh, I'd love a leg up on a panel show, or I'd much rather not be you know have the high likelihood that. Most women, over 60% of women, are going to experience some kind of sexual trauma before they're 18 years old. What the fuck would they choose? Mm -hmm. So it's just really weird that no one talks about stuff like that. It's gone on a really serious tangent, guys. <laughs> uh, Willies. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. It's always it's the way out. Um, Richard Thompson, how's the um, how's the Antoine de Cleverly champagne? Is it nice? Yeah, it's going down all right. Is it going all right? You've got a whole bottle there. Fifteen quid. Um, do you have a question? <laughs> would, you, would you like to ask Dane a question? That is part of your, that's what's given to your powers for what you've done. You don't have to use it. Make it a good one. <laughs> Might be the last one. Do, do you fear robots? <laughs> um, do you fear robots? No, I, I, don't, I don't really fear robots, but it's an interesting Why point. Not? Why don't Why I fear not? them? Good question. How? Why don't I fear them? Uh, you should fear robots. That wasn't even a question. That's good. That was a man going, yeah, yeah. you, you Dave should, fear, Patrick, should yeah, yeah. fear robots I, because they're coming yeah. for you. No, no. I, I don't fear them because I guess I guess because it's the, in, the inevitable, you know, there's okay, technological advances and the gap between them is getting smaller and smaller. So, you know, artificial intelligence is, is here already. So I guess you can't really fear something that's already taking place. But it's an interesting point to bring up because yeah. when we discuss our contract and economy and we discuss issues like Brexit, you know, as a lot of us know that one of the, uh, I guess one of the motivators for people voting for Brexit was to have, you know, availability of jobs for, you know, people of Anglo-Saxon descent. But, you know, with the rise of the robots, you know, this is, that's, that's a race that have their own language and their own culture and don't need sleep and they're very insulated <laughs> and no one can compete with them. So really, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe we should be afraid. Because yeah. robots, they don't need sleep or passports. No. <laughs> they can be brought in bit by bit. They as can well. be, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Sneak them in because they can, they can, they can sneak in they as well. Yeah. Just be here. They can get them out of the ground here. Yeah. The British robots made by British people. Exactly. <laughs> do, you, do you think that uh, having sex with a robot is, is cheating if you're, in a, if you're married? Because I don't. Uh. <laughs> I think it's no. Be I, I, I guess it's your like, definition of a robot because yeah. surely a vibrator is a form of robot, then, yeah, right? It is. And far be it from me to tell somebody what they do with their vibrator. <laughs> so yeah, I guess it is. It's not. It's not. I guess. Would you have cheating. sex with a robot? Have you seen Westworld yet? This is a new. No, no. Robot but I, I saw her though, which I guess is again dealing with. Uh, okay. Yeah. What. Well, I guess interspecies is not the right word because robots aren't technically a species, no. but yeah. There's just nothing, it's fine. 
Yeah. The problem with the TV shows listening. is they make the robots like have like a, oh they come alive and they have a f- feelings. They're not gonna. So it's all right, man. But if they are, Richard said that, not me. Robots. <laughs> no, so, it's just yeah. a, it's like an elaborate wank. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. They're and really good at remembering things, by the way, robots. Yeah, they so are. Just, yeah. And also, you know, if you get bored, you can just ask them a sum, a really difficult sum, and they oh, can exactly, tell you the yeah, answer. They can work it out, yeah. It's my ideal woman, really. And it's <laughs> like, if you say, what's this? It's like, being, it's like Susie Dent and Gara Vorderman and all the other women off humans all rolled, Gemma Chan rolled into one, isn't it? Yeah. Go, what is the definition of apocalypse? And they'll tell you. What a world, what a brave new world it's going to be. Uh, it's been lovely talking to you, Dane, uh, and uh, thanks very much for coming on the show. Uh, do go and see him. If you get a chance, he's going to be a massive superstar very soon, and you saw him here first. Ladies and gentlemen, Dane Baptiste. Thank you very much. Yes. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>